I'm glad we're doing a series on, on the Psalms because Psalms are really about finding hope to make life better. And it's from real life experiences, largely of King David and what he went through in life and how God was so real to him and helped him to have a better life than he ever could on his own. And today we're going to take a look at bouncing back from failure. If you play video games or get to play video games, if you make a mistake in the video games, often you can get another life. And you can keep on going. And somebody pulls you out of the mess if you're playing Mario Karts and they pull you back onto the track. And you just keep going again. And failures don't really count too much because you always get an extra life. Well, in the Christian faith, failures do hurt. Failures are difficult. But God can help us to grow through them. And in 33 years of ministry, I've come across a lot of different failures. I've made failures myself. There's been failures that uh, people go through in relationships. Sometimes a marriage comes to an end or a parent-child relationship is is severed or a a good friendship comes to an end. In careers, sometimes there's disappointment because people don't get to the position that they hope to and they end up working at a job they really don't enjoy and it isn't that meaningful. And for a lot of us, we just don't achieve the dreams that we had hoped we would accomplish. And there's a sense of failure and not realizing what you hoped you would have been able to do with your life. I don't know what kind of failures you've gone through, but I do know that failures are painful. And we have different ways of responding to them, don't we? Sometimes we don't try again. We don't want to go through it again. We're afraid to get back on the horse and we never get a chance to pursue that dream that we had. Sometimes we just suffer this depression and discouragement about life. Sometimes that can lead to alcohol and drugs or pornography to to lift up our spirits. For me, I'm a workaholic. If I fail at something, I just work harder, run faster, and and try to uh, outrun my failures uh, by achieving something else instead. But failures can lead us feeling like a a failure, and our self-esteem can be damaged. So I want to encourage you that if you have suffered any disappointment, any failure in life, that God is there to help us to rebuild our lives. So let's take a look at some folks who've gone through failure. Do you know what failure Phillips Recording Company, Decca Recording Company, and Columbia had in their business? Yeah, they thought the Beatles were no useless. They didn't see any musical ability in the Beatles, so they refused to sign them. And of course, that was a multi-billion dollar mistake that they made and they had to live with. How about Blockbuster? Remember back in the days, Friday, Saturday night, we'd go to Blockbuster to, to rent a video for that evening? Well, they had an opportunity to buy Netflix for $50 million. Well, that was a $90 billion mistake that they made. Makes our failures look a little bit less. And how about Ronald Wayne? Anybody know Ronald Wayne? Anybody know Steve Jobs? Okay, Ronald Wayne was one of Steve Jobs' partners when they started Apple. Ronald sold out in 1976 for $800. He sold his 10% share of Apple for $800. That was an $80 billion mistake. So you feel a bit better now? Because no matter how much we failed, somebody else has failed more. It was said about this person, did my battery die? Okay. Teacher said he was too stupid to learn. Thomas Edison went on to invent the light bulb. Where would we be without the light bulb? Teacher said he was too stupid to learn. Some people said about this person, mentally slow, adrift, and forever foolish in his dreams. Albert Einstein. And how about this person? Am I going to have to say next? Newspaper editor fired him because he didn't have any creative ideas. Next. Walt Disney. Now, th- those people probably feel really crummy <laughs> for making those judgments. But what if Edison, Einstein, and Disney believed what they had said? They would have given up their dreams. They wouldn't bother trying. They would have never got back on that horse again. So if we fail, it does not mean that we are a failure. So please don't let anybody try to convince you of otherwise. To fail does not mean that you're a failure. If, oh, okay, I'm going to have to count on... Is Ben in the room? Oh, okay. You didn't tell me that. I'm not going to blame you. Anyway, so we, we'll back up. Okay, 
200 mistakes trying to invent the polio vaccine. 200 times he failed. So easy to give up, but he kept on trying, and he was able to conclude, I didn't fail 200 times, but 200 times I learned a way not to make the vaccine. It was a learning experience. And of course, one of the greatest basketball players of all time, Michael Jordan, listened to what he said, that he'd missed more than 9,000 shots. I've lost almost 300 games. I've been trusted 26 times to make the game-winning shot, and I blew it. I failed, and I failed, and I failed. But that was the key to my success. So failures can be good. Somebody has failed more than you have, so put it in perspective. And failures are an opportunity to learn. And that's what we're going to take a look at today in the life of King David. You know, the Bible has the stories of a lot of failures. Abraham, the, the father of the, of, of the family of God. And uh, David, the most powerful ruler in the world at his time. Peter, Paul, all failed terribly. And their failures are recorded for all time for people to read. But God used their failures to help them really develop their potential in life. Well, we all know about David's failures um, as the time when all the kings are going out to, to lead their armies and, and, and overcome other countries and ex expand their territory. David stayed at home. Maybe he thought, I'm just going to chill out, take it easy. He did not assume his responsibility as leader by leading his country into battle. He stayed at home. He couldn't sleep at night, so he's walking the, the rooftop gardens, and he noticed this beautiful woman in the neighborhood and naked, uh, having a bath outside, and, and uh, David said to his servants, uh, who is she? And, and they said, well, she's Bathsheba, wife of Uriah. He said, go get her for me. And they did. He had sexual relationships with her, sent her home, then found out later that she was pregnant. Now he's got a problem on his hand. What is he going to do? What if Uriah, her husband, finds out that she's pregnant? He knows he's not the father. And she, he presses her to find out who the, the father was, and she blurts out, it's David. Well, Uriah could go and try to kill David. Or if the other people in the community find out about it, he could lose their respect as a leader. So he doesn't want to suffer this potential loss. He's got to think, what do I do? Oh, I know what to do. I'll call Uriah from the battlefield, and I'll send him home to his wife. He can have sexual relationships with his wife, and I'll pawn this baby off on Uriah. Everything will be fine. He brings Uriah home and sends Uriah to be with Bathsheba, but Uriah won't do it. He sleeps on the porch of, of the king. David calls him the next day. Why didn't you go home? And Uriah said, how could I possibly go and have sex with my wife when my fellow countrymen are out in the battlefield giving the lies to the country? Think David felt a bit convicted about that? And it goes to plan B. He gets Uriah drunk, sends him back to his wife, but Uriah won't go. He sleeps on the porch with David's servants again. So David's deception is not working. He sends Uriah back to the battlefield. He tells Commander Job, put Uriah on the front line, pull back, let Uriah get killed. And Job does that. Uriah dies. David thinks he's home free. Everything is easy. So let's think for a moment. What mistakes did David make? What was his failure? Anybody? Don't be shy. I have to be home by Monday, but... <laughs> he didn't go to battle. Yeah, he should have been. All the other kings were going. That was a mistake he made. What else did he do that was wrong? Hmm? Lying, trying to pawn a, his baby off on Uriah? Anything else he did wrong? Pardon? He gave into lust and had sex, had adultery. Anything else he did wrong? Yeah, he follows him temptation. He ended up killing a man and... He really played God. He, he abused his power. In, in corporate world, if you do that, you'd lose your job. He abused his power because he as king could tell Bathsheba, I want you. And either, A, she would voluntarily give in because, wow, the king wants me, or probably involuntarily give in. If I don't give in, my life could be in jeopardy. He abused his power. He played God. He broke six of the Ten Commandments. Six of the Ten Commandments. But let's start from a moment. Where did he start to go wrong? And you talked about it started with the lust. But even before that, he did something wrong. What started on the downward spiral? What was his first step that he did wrong? 
Hmm? <laughs> Staying home, not going out, as the king should do. Anything else he did wrong? Covered his neighbor's wife, yeah. And he stole his neighbor's wife, yeah. Put himself before others. There was one word that was missing from that chapter and that story they're told. One little word that was missing and never referred to. That little word, three letters, God. God is, in all of David's life, that's one chapter that you don't hear the word God. He'd never mentioned it, never thought about God. Now here's a man who wrote maybe a hundred psalms. He talked about this God. You could have an intimate love relationship. It could be your best friend. How God was always there. How God loved you and always had your best interests at heart. But in this time in David's life, he's taken his eyes off God. As if God doesn't exist. He's doing all of this in the presence of God, who he said is always with him. So that's where he went wrong. He, he left his relationship with God. He wasn't following God. A lot of his life, he was following God. He wrote many psalms about how closely you follow God. But for this time in his life, he was not following God. And that's where he went wrong. And that's the heart of any failure that we have in life. Because at that time, the thing that often leads to our failure is we're making decisions independently of God. We've forgotten he's right there with us. We've forgotten that he cares about us. He loves us deeply. We forgot that he has his best interests at heart. And maybe uh, the Holy Spirit will bring to mind something that God wants us to do that will help us in that situation. But you override and say, no, I'm not going to do that. I, I know better in this situation. That's not going to work. It's too, too much of a price to pay. My way is faster, quicker, better. I know better than God. And that's the heart of all failure. And the ultimate failure is not following God because you don't want to end your life not following God. God. You don't want to think you're following God, but in reality, you're really not following God. See, as his God was the sex goddess Bathsheba. For a period in his life, that was his God. He gave her his devotion, his obedience. He gave his heart to her. And his God was himself, as he said before, not putting others first. You're living for yourself. He was really functioning his own God. He wasn't following God. And that was the heart of his problem. He didn't even realize it until God sent Nathan the prophet to go and tell him. And Nathan told this little story about there was a poor man, had one little lamb he loved, let the lamb eat at his table. He, he treated the lamb as a family member. But as a rich man, had a massive flocks. And the rich man was having a party. Instead of the rich man using one of his own sheep to feed for his friends, he stole the, the poor man's one and only you that he loved and cared for and, and killed it. And when David heard that story, David responded... David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as sure as, he, as the Lord lives, that man who did this must die. So what God was doing through Nathan was helping David stand in the shoes of Uriah, understand what Uriah went through, but also understand how God felt about what David had done. And then and only then does David come face to face with where he is in his life. Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord of God Israel says. And so David realizes he's the one that's done it wrong, that he has sinned against God. And Nathan is really speaking God's words. It's God's message to David through Nathan. I anointed you king over Israel and delivered you from all the hand of Saul. I gave you my, your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all of Israel and Judah. And if this would have not been too little, I would have given you even more. So he's reminding David how much God loves him, how much he cares for him, all the things God has done for him, taking from a little shepherd boy to be king of the most powerful country at its time. God had done all of that. He's reminding God, uh, David of God's incredible um, grace that God has given to David. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? If you want a definition of what sin is, it's despising the word of the Lord. It's saying, I don't care what God has to say. I know better in this situation. Um, it's failing to trust God's promises. All those promises that God has made for us, it's failing to trust it. And God feels, you're despising me. You're not taking me seriously. You're not valuing me for who I am. You don't think I know what's best. I've created you. I've created life. You despise me because you're not treating me with the respect that I deserve. And you struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. 
Now therefore the sword will never depart from your house because he despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own twice. God uses the word despise. Can you imagine how hurt God is? He's done all of this for David. Yet David doesn't trust him, doesn't think God's way is best, thinks he knows better than God. He actually despises God. And God feels terribly hurt. Not only for himself, that David doesn't value him, but he feels hurt for David. David is missing out God's best by running his life his own way. He has to suffer the consequences from the poor decisions he's making independently of God. God's hurting for David and for himself. So what does David do in this when he realizes where he's really gone wrong? The ultimate failure in life is despising God, not believing he loves you, cares for you, is always with you, always has your best interests at heart. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And I think he's saying that with all sincerity. Now he says one little sentence, I've sinned against the Lord. And what does the Lord do? Nathan replies, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. What? He killed a man. He had adultery. He stole a man's wife and gets off scot-free just for saying, I'm sorry. Is that all you have to do? Well, that's where we're going into Psalm 51 because Psalm 51 really understands what it truly means to be sorry for what you have done wrong. But look at the amazing grace when we are truly generally sorry for no matter what we have done, no matter how bad it is, God is very gracious to forgive. Because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the Son born to you will die. So God will forgive us. doesn't mean we get away from the consequences. God doesn't erase consequences. He forgives us. We don't have to carry the guilt. We don't have to space eternity apart from a holy God. We can be totally forgiven. But once again, he uses the word contempt. Twice he used despise, once he used contempt. He wants us to understand that when we live independently of a God who loves us, who is always with us, who always has our best interests at heart, who's totally dependable and faithful, God feels that we're despising him and we're holding him in contempt. He's deeply grieved by that. So what does real uh, apology look like? Psalm 51, and we're going through the Psalms, and this is very powerful, totally different than any other Psalm and that you've been reading about because it gets to the heart of David, it gets to the heart of forgiveness and the heart of a relationship with God. And again, this is David's prayer to God. Against you, you only have sin and then what is evil in your sight, you're right when you're, you're verdict and justified when you judge. So you can sense the sorrow for what he's done. He's not sorry he got caught. He's not sorry he's suffering the consequences. He's not sorry that he looks bad. He is sorry that he's sinned against God, that he's despised him, he's held him in contempt. He hasn't been grateful for what God has done. He's looked down upon God and his wisdom. He's lived as if God doesn't exist and that God was not worth following. And he feels very sorry for that. That's the heart of genuine repentance, of sorrow for living as if God is not worth following. Repent with sorrow for hurting God. That's the key to finding forgiveness. That's the key to um, uh, really rebuilding your life after a failure. You recognize the heart of the failure is not trusting God and following God and expressing to God personally sorrow, maybe even with tears, for what you've done and how you fail to honor God with the respect that he deserves. We'll go further in Psalm 51 because it gives us more keys in, in how to do this. You have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. So as we tell God sincerely how badly we feel for not following him. God wants to reach out to us with his incredible mercy, his compassion for us. It's amazing that God has, has had us sin against him. He's deeply hurt by what we have done. Yet, even though he's deeply hurt, he has a heart of compassion for us. He feels for us because he knows we're missing out our best. By, we're not walking closely with God. We're missing out the best that God has in store for us. So his great compassion, he's willing to blot out our transgressions, even though he's been hurt by them. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He wants to be clean. He wants to have the guilt removed. Only God can wipe the slate. Other people may never forgive you for what you've done wrong. You may have a hard time forgiving yourself, but God, who has been hurt more than anyone else by your indiscretion, is the one who forgives us completely. Since he wipes the slate clean, we can wipe the slate clean as well.
Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. You know, God is willing to forgive and forget and to give a totally clean slate. That's the amazing grace of God. Never hold it against us. Won't bring it back up again. Never hold a grudge against us. He forgives us totally if we sincerely ask for his forgiveness. Not in the back of the mind, oh, I'm going to do it again. No, God, I'm sorry and I really need to work with you to stop this because I don't want to keep on sinning against you. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. He does give us a brand new, fresh start in our life. And that's the amazing grace of God. If you've done anything wrong, and let me encourage you, sincerely ask God to forgive you, maybe even with tears, express your sorrow for despising God. He forgives you. And receive that forgiveness. Others may hold that grudge against you. Ignore them. God has forgiven. You may have a hard time forgiving yourself. And yes, you still have to deal with the consequences, but God forgives you completely. Receive his, his forgiveness. Let it fill your heart and fill your heart with joy. Joyfully thank God for his costly forgiveness and thank him for the, cost, the price he paid that his son Jesus was willing to die on the cross and take upon himself all the guilt that we deserve for everything we've done against God. He's deeply hurt by what we've done, but he's willing to take the punishment. Jesus suffered hell on the cross. He was separated from his father. He couldn't even call his father, father. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He suffered hell on the cross that we don't have to, that we can go to heaven. So thank him for his costly forgiveness. Anybody ever hear of country singer Jimmy Wayne? Anybody? Jimmy, no country singer, uh, country music fans here. Anyway, he was a, a well-known uh, uh, country singer back in the early 2000s. And he had a tough life. Um, his, he never knew his father. His mother was in and out of jail. In fact, when uh, Jimmy was a young teenager, um, his mother and her boyfriend lived in an Oldsmobile Delta, and Jimmy slept in the back seat, and they just traveled around trying to escape the police. One day, his mother just stopped in a Greyhound bus terminal, let Jimmy out with his little plastic bag of clothes, and said, I love you, but goodbye, and left him. Could you imagine how rejected you would feel your own mother leaves you there to fend for yourself with nothing but a plastic bag and some of your clothes? And he had to live in the streets. One day, he was going down the street, and you saw an elderly man named Russell in his garage, and, and Jimmy went up to him and said, is there any work I can do around your house? And Russell in the 70s said, uh, he realized he was a homeless kid, and he said, okay, can you cut grass? And Jimmy said, sure, and Russell gave him the lawnmower, and he let him cut the grass. When he was done, he paid him 20 bucks, and Jimmy went to walk away, and Russell said, hey, grass needs to be cut next week. <laughs> and Jimmy came back next week and the week after, and Russell and his wife, B, said to him one day, hey, do you want to live with us? You can tell you're homeless. Do you want to live with us? We've got a room for you. We'll feed you. You can, you can stay with us. Jimmy could not believe what he was hearing, but he took up their offer. But he's never quite sure. He always kept his clothes in a little bag by the door, ready to leave at the drop of a hat, because he's never experienced this kind of love before. And uh, they realized he wasn't really part of the family yet, so they sat down with him and had a heart-to-heart -heart and said, we want you to be part of our family. We want you to stay here as long as you want to stay. We just want you to be part of our family. And he was. He went to church with them, became a Christian. Later on, he, after his music career was over, he spent his life trying to promote fostering children. Now, the amazing gra grace that Russell and B showed Jimmy is just a small sampling of the grace of God. Because when we were far from God, walking into a Christless eternity, not even knowing God, living independently of God, God somehow reached out to us and found us, made himself known to us. He showed us that Jesus' son died for us and he encouraged us to enter a relationship with us and he's willing to live inside of us by his Holy Spirit to never leave us and forsake us because he loves us that much. So joyfully thank God for his costly forgiveness. And lastly, let's learn the lesson of Michael Jordan. Let's learn from our failures and that's what David does in the rest of Psalm 51. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. He's asking God now that God's forgiven him to give him a heart that, that's pure, that only wants to follow God, that doesn't want to think or do anything that grieves the heart of God. And he wants to make that his life goal. 
Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. He wants to be reminded by the Holy Spirit that he always lives in God's presence. He forgot about God when he was with Bathsheba and when he was deceiving Uriah and when he killed uh, Uriah. He totally forgot about God. He never wants to go down that road again. He, wa he wants to live every second in the presence of God and to be reminded that God is always with him and loves him. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit to stay me, Lord. Give me a spirit to do what you want, not what I want. In every situation of life, give me that desire to do what you want me to do, not what I want to do. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, so sinners will turn them back to you. Then he will start living for God in a way that will motivate others to live for God. And he ended his life doing that, and his life motivates us to follow God. Open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. He wants to live a thanksgiving for what God has done for him, not coveting what other people have, but rather grateful for all that God has given to him. Okay, just jump ahead for a moment here. And so how did his end, life end up? Acts says this about a man who committed adultery, who lied, who coveted another person's wife, who killed a man. This is his final report card in life in Acts 13. God testified concerning David. I found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. And in verse 36, Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, and he fell asleep, he was buried with his ancestors, and his body decayed. So a sign of report card, he, he passes with flying colors. He, because even though he did some of the worst things he could ever do in life, he was sincerely sorry. God forgave him wiped the slate clean and help David learn from his mistakes and finish well. And that's what God wants to do for us as well. Learn from failure to wholeheartedly obey God. See, failures can be our greatest learning experience in life. Learn from God, from our failures, and how to follow God more closely. In that case, failures can be our friends if we allow God to use them for our personal growth. There's a dump in Paraguay, and uh, there's a lot of poor children there who will go to that dump all day, just pick garbage, and, and make a, a few, few, few dollars a day. And, and that's their life. Well, there's a couple of men that were troubled by that. One of them was uh, Fabio Chavez, who was an environmentalist, and uh, he loved music. He thought kids, if they could learn music, that would really give them a great future help them to feel good about themselves. And he had a friend, Don Cola Gomez, who was a mechanic. He liked to build things and make things. So they went to the dump, and they made instruments from the things you would find in the dump. And then uh, Fabio trained the children how to play the musical instruments. And they formed the Landfill Harmonic Orchestra. Let's, li let's listen. OK, you can throw that in now. ¿Entienden? Bueno, entonces tienen que atender. kids in Paraguay actually made all of the instruments out of trash. Look at this. That's a fork, people. Let's give 
Let the music shine through tonight on that stage.